الحمد لله ويلكم جزاك الله خير ان تو مالمو نعم يس اي وود لايك تو ستارت ذس انترفيو ويز لايك جوينغ تو يور باك جراوند نعم اف يو كود تيل اس اباوت يور سيلف واي دو يو ثينك سو ماني بيبل ار هير تونايت واي دو اي ثينك ذا بيبل هير يا Well, I think it's because of your promotion, your advertising. I'm sure they're not here for me only. You know, I'm sure for the brotherhood, the sisterhood, I'm really love. But you're you know. known before for something. Yeah. Like um. Like no. Bismillah wa rahman. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um. I used to be involved in the music industry in a group called the Outlaws, um, with Tupac Shakur. So I'm sure some of the people may know me from that lifestyle. You know. But I hope, inshallah, they're here for other reasons, inshallah. And you left that, li you left that lifestyle. So I would like to, to go back to your childhood. Yes. yes. And if you could tell us about your situation when you were younger, no. and how the environment was where you grew up, yes. and your family situation. No. Um, I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. And um, my parents, alhamdulillah, was actually Muslim, converts to the religion of Islam. Um, at the age of three, my mother and father got murdered in front of me, me and my brothers, so we moved with my grandparents. My grandparents, alhamdulillah, they raised us to the best of their ability, but um, they, weren't Muslim. they weren't Muslim. Majority of my family, they're Christian. My parents were also Christian, but they accepted Islam before I was born. So being raised in Irvington, New Jersey, North New Jersey, I started to get involved in the street life at a very young age with my brothers and my cousins. My older brothers and my old, older siblings, they was involved in, in, in the street life, you know, drug dealing, um, the stuff that, you know, people do in the inner cities. And I tried to follow in their footsteps, um, but it didn't quite work out for me. Alhamdulillah, I failed as a drug dealer, alhamdulillah, you know. Um, the first day that I went outside on the block and I tried to hustle, I got arrested. The police came, took me to prison. I was maybe 13, 14 years old. They took me into a holding cell, not prison. You know, they called my grandparents. I got a, of course, I got a whooping, you know. How, how old were you? I was about 13 years old at that particular time. So my environment growing up in New Jersey, it was a tough environment, you know, but I, I was always one of them type of people that wanted to make it a part of this environment. I never felt comfortable um, living in that situation. You know, I used to always have in the back of my mind that one day I have to get up out of this situation, you know. And, um... Alhamdulillah, eventually I was able to get up out of that situation. What, what was your goal at that young age? Well, my goals, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I wanted to, to pursue, I wanted to figure a way to make it up out of the hood. Most of the people at that particular time in my neighborhood, especially my friends and my relatives, they wanted to fall victim to what everyone else was falling victim to in the neighborhood, which was um, drug dealing, which was criminal activities. But I used to always say, and I had a feeling, you know, I used to have this feeling that I, I was going to make it up out of there. So um, at that particular time, you know, music was known, of course, and, and especially back then, this was the early 90s, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I decided to get into to music, you know, whatever I would see outside, I would go into my room, I would make a song out of it. And I, I started to get a name for myself in my hood, in my neighborhood. How, how did you get that name? Like, did you go out and rap or you, because you were just doing this at home? No, I would go out and rap, you know what I mean? I'd go rap for the drug dealers and they would pay me. And um, pay you for rap? Yeah, they'd pay me, give me a dollar, give me two dollars, you know what I mean? So I was hustling at a very young age. At that particular time, man, it wasn't like now, where everybody want to be a rapper. You know, I probably was the only person in my neighborhood at that particular time that was into music, into rap. So everybody in my neighborhood supported me. I'm talking about from the, from the gangsters, from the drug dealers, from the thugs, from the geeks. Everybody wanted to see someone from the hood make it. So I had support, alhamdulillah. No. Um, how, how was your economic situation, economical situation at that young age? I come I'm from a middle class family. You know, my grandparents, um, my grandfather, he was a hard worker. Um, I come from a middle, a middle class family. I, I, I want to sit here and say that I was in poverty because pretty much everything I wanted as a kid, my grandparents would eventually get it for me. It might take some time. But when I got involved in drug dealing and tried to follow the footsteps of my brothers, it's because it, it came quicker, you know? Seeing my brothers and my cousins walk in the house with new clothes and new sneakers. But I can admit, my grandparents, they did a very good job raising us. We decided to hit the streets and, and be knuckleheads, you know? 
your grandparents, were they religious in some way, or did they try to bring you up in a religious yes. mind? My grandmother was very, very religious. I'm talking about as a youngster, every Sunday, me and my brothers was in church. She was one of them ladies that, if I say that if I ever met a serious Christian, my grandmother was a serious Christian. So she tried her best to raise me and my brothers and my cousins, you know, upon Christianity. Um, and she tried her best, you know what I mean? But at a very young age, even pro way before I accepted the religion of Islam, I didn't feel comfortable in church. And I, I lived a, 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 a good amount of period of my life just believing in God, you know? What was that so, what was, what was it that, that made you comfortable in the church? Well, well first of all, you know, um, going to church, reading the Bible, things didn't add up. I seen a lot of contradiction in the Bible and no one can give me answers, not even my grandmother. You know, the people in the Christianity and church, they have a statement, it's, it's one of the foundations that they believe you just have to believe. You know, they won't give you no answer if you, if you ask them how come, for example, you telling me to pray to Jesus, but there's nothing in the Bible where Jesus say he's God, or there's nothing in the Bible where Jesus say pray to me. So the church will just tell you you have to believe, you know what I mean? So I didn't like that type of system of religion or that way of life, so I didn't feel comfortable with that. So, so you were young, you were rapping, uh, the people in the streets were giving you one, two dollars, but no. when did you hit it? When well, I, I got well, serious uh, in the... Yeah. How did it hit, huh? <laughs> well, I got serious in the music industry um, through a childhood friend of mine. Um, his name was Yafeo, he was known as Gaddafi. Um, we grew up as youngsters, you know, when we was very small, we had birthdays a couple days apart. His mother was also a family friend of the family. So years went past and I happened to, I lost contact with him, but I ran into his mom's. And she asked me what I'm trying to do with my life. At that time, music was my goal and my dream, so I told her I wanted to be a rapper. Um, and I asked her, how was her son doing? She said, matter of fact, my son is also trying to be in the music industry. And he said, she asked me, do you know Tupac Shakur? And I told her, of course. At this particular time, Pac, he was known, he put one or two records out. She said, well, my son, that's his half-brother, you know? She said, and if you're serious, uh, matter of fact, they're on their way to New York City. You should go over there and meet them. And maybe about a month or, or whatever went, came by, and I was able to get on the train, and I went to New York City, and I walked into the hotel room, and Pac was in the hotel room, you know? And I was a knucklehead then, you know, so I walked in there, you know, with my confidence. I gave him my, my CD, my tape back then. We had tapes, you know? My cassette, yeah, I gave him my cassette. And um, I rapped for him, and he told me he wanted to put a group together. He wanted me to be part of that group. At that particular time, I didn't trust him. I, I thought he was like um, many other artists that I ran to in the music industry, because I was trying very hard. I ran into different artists. I gave them my CD, my tape. But Pac said, I'm gonna help you. You know, I'm, I, I, wanna, I want you to be part of this group. The other people that you gave your tape to, did they say no, no thanks? No, nah, they didn't get back at you. That's the problem in the music yeah. industry. Yeah, they don't, the people in the music industry is probably some of the, um, what you can, they, they don't really have concern of truthfulness, you know what I mean? So, but Pac, when he said it, I'm gonna get back at you, I thought he was just like the rest of them, you know? But then I get a phone call one day, and they told me to come to New York City. He's back in New York City, he's in a recording studio. He said, come to the recording studio, I wanna see what you made of. And he gave me that opportunity. So, uh, your friendship started with Tupac. Uh, how, how was Tupac as a person? Well, well Pac, Pac as a person, man, as the, even the first day that I met him, he knew a little bit about me because of his aunt, you know, which was a family friend. So he started to ask me about the death of my mother and father. So when I started to tell him about the death of my mother and father, I looked up across the room and he was crying. And for me, you know, coming from the hood, nobody never reacted over the story of the death of my parents. So I was shocked to see this individual crying. Well, I felt a little embarrassed, you know what I mean? And I told him no need to cry. So he was one of them type of individuals, sensitive person, and he tried his best to do what he thought was correct, you know? So, uh, and then you started this group. And how did, how, how was the lifestyle when you were hanging out with Tupac and Outlaws? And well, the lifestyle, most people don't know with Pac, and um, when I look back at it, I say this is also from my law. Pac was very um, protective, you know? Every member of the Outlaws was actually related to Tupac. And the ones who are not related to Tupac, we are friends of a, of, of a relative of Pac. For example, Edie is the cousin of Tupac, Cash is the cousin, Gaddafi is his brother, myself was, you know, childhood friends of Gaddafi, Fado was childhood friends of Gaddafi, Young Noble. So every single one of us, we knew each other since kids. Pac wasn't a type, he doesn't allow anybody to get close into his circle. 
So that made him overprotective. You know what I mean? That made him overprotective because he's chilling with his cousins and you know his auntie, the kids of his aunts, and um, so he was he was really overprotective. It wasn't like we lived with him and it was partying every night. We literally have to sneak when he go to sleep. We used to sneak out of his house just to go have fun or go party because he wouldn't allow us, you know what I mean? So what was the goal with Outlaws? What was the, you know, when you were talking with Tupac, like what, what were you trying to create? No. Well, with the music industry, man, we wanted to, um, Pac wanted to create, he was also a member of the Outlaws. When he put the Outlaws together, he wanted to create uh, a new offset of thug life, you know what I mean? And, and we really wanted to take music to a whole nother level. We had the tension, we was gonna start doing plays. Literally, we was gonna do plays and we was gonna um, do movies. This was the intention that we wanted to do. Um, we was in the process of building a compound and each outlaw would have their own house on the compound and Pac was there. We had plans that we wanted to pursue further than the music industry. And it came to an end, you know? Did you feel like you were free to, to have your own goals and dreams, or was it like uh, directed by the music industry? At that particular time, man, I was lost. My whole dreams and goal, I wanted it to be connected to the music industry. And um, my loyalty was with Outlaws, my loyalty was with Pac, my loyalty was with the music industry. And I, I couldn't see myself ever living without the music industry, you know what I mean? So I wanted to continue that life. But you know what I mean, we had, and, and also our plans was with Pac, you know what I mean? We thought, literally, I used to think that this life would never come to an end. It would always be around, it would always be us, you know, this is what we always used to believe in. So I mean, I mean, a lot of people think like, wow, living with Tupac, this compound, you know, having all the money and the riches and everything, that, that's happiness. But what, what happened that, you know, were you just happy all the time or was there like moments when you doubted this? Like, um, as well. To be honest, in the music industry, I don't real, I don't know if that if I ever came across a person who was actually happy. I don't think I ever met an individual in the music industry that wasn't depressed, that wasn't always doped up or high on some type of drugs. I didn't even myself speaking from experience, speaking from Tupac, knowing them. Nobody's happy in the music industry, and I believe because from the outside looking in and, and speaking speaking from experience, when I wanted to get in the music industry, some, from seeing these rappers on television and you see the way they live in their life in a five minute video that they show you these houses and these cars and these jewelry and this money, from the outside looking in, it seemed like this is the life that you want. But when I actually put myself in that position and I started to make money, at one particular time in my life I had my own homes, three houses and cars, but every single night I went to sleep I was depressed. And, and this- but Where did that depression come from? The depression come because I was a slave to the music industry. And I believe if an individual not living his life according to what was legislated for him to live by the one who created him, he could never be happy, no matter how much money he had. If you're not living the, the way that Allah wants us to live, your millions or your billions will not keep you happy. You have millionaires that commit suicide, you know what I mean? So, and I guess that I was a slave to the music industry, and not I guess I was, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you know, when you listen to Tupac's uh, lyrics, there's a lot to do with like Islam and Muslims sometimes. Were, were Tupac a religious person and when you were hanging out with him and the outlaws, did you have like religious discussions about faith, afterlife? And no, nah, we wasn't, um, we was definitely not religious at all. And like most Americans, they might say that they're a Christian or a rapper might have a big cross but nobody's religious. Nobody want to pray, nobody want to go to church, <laughs> nobody want to go to the masjid. You know, we was one of them individuals that the only time that you will actually hear us talk about religion if it rhymes in a song. And Pac, he had no religion from what I know. You know what I mean? He wasn't, he wasn't a religious person. He might have respect Islam. He, was, he had respect for Islam. He had Muslim relatives, but he wasn't a Muslim when he passed away. And none of us at that particular time were religious, you know? So what made you like leave that because you left that? I left I how did it actually, start? It started one um, when I accepted the religion of Islam. You know, actually before that, after the death of Tupac, I started to get more curious about death. This was the first time, you know, like I mentioned, I lost my mother and father when I was three years old, but as a kid, you don't remember, you know? And Tupac was an individual that I lived in the same house with him. 
My bedroom is here, his bedroom is here. This was an individual, every single day we woke up in the morning, we went with him, we just ate with him, we partied with him, we, every day I was with him, you know? So to wake up one day, and this is like a brother uh, of ours or our leader, to wake up one day and this individual, you come out the room, he's no longer in the house, he, he's no longer around you, and he truly is gone. You know, I started to want to know what was happening to him. I started to get curious. Uh, how, how did you get to know that Tupac was sick? How, how did you react? Well, we, well, before he died, we got the phone call that he got shot. When we got the phone call that he got shot, myself and Young Noble, we was two members of the Outlaws that were still in Los Angeles. The rest of the Outlaws was in Las Vegas with Tupac. When we got the phone call that Pac got shot, the first thing came to my mind is, well, he got shot before. And five times and he made it, so he's going to make it again, you know? So we drove up there, you know, put all types of weapons, guns in the trunk, and we drove to Las Vegas which is a three hour drive from Los Angeles. But when I seen him in the hospital bed, that's when I knew how severe it was. I knew that it didn't look like he was gonna make it from out of that position, you know? And then he, you, he died, and then no. what were you thinking about that? When he died, I remember we was in the hospital and um, his mother and him came out and she said, I'm gonna pull the plug, you know? And when he pulled the plug, it hit us, you know, that this is an individual that you know, that we with him, and this was, like I said, this was the first time that reality of death struck because it, it, it came real close to home, and I wasn't expecting, I was only 17 years old at that particular time, so I wasn't expecting to lose anyone close to me. So after the death of Pac, like many of us in the inner city, we don't know how to deal with death, but rather get high and get drunk and, and make a whole bunch of songs on how we're gonna kill the people back that killed Tupac, and this was our healing um, process. It was a rivalry between different groups. The people that killed Pac was actually, they were some gang members from Compton, California. And you can say it was a rivalry. These was individuals that, you know, Tupac was on a record, a label called Death Row Records, which was started by Suge Knight, who come from the background of Bloods. The individual that murdered Tupac, they come from a background of Crips. And these Crips and the gang of Bloods from Suge Knight, they was rivalry since children. So Pac coming as an innocent person, signing a record deal with Death Row, it put itself liable to gang violence, you know? And, uh, so he died and it, it really shook you, and then what happened? I was, I was curious about death because I remember as an individual, you know, sometimes we used to sit with Pac and he used to always speak about how he don't want to live. You know, he used to say, I want to die. He was suicidal at times. He used to sit and say, man, I want to die, I want to kill myself, I don't want to live anymore. Even in his music, he used to express this in his music. Um, but what made me more concerned, because after he went to death for records and he started to make a lot of money, you know what I mean? He had a house, a few houses, Rolls Royces, Bentleys, he was making good money. And I remember we had a conversation with him. You know, we sat down in the living room and his exact words was, remember how I used to always speak about how I don't want to live anymore. He said, but for some reason now that I'm making all this money, I want to live. And a couple months later, he actually died. So that's when I started to think and, and I started to realize that from reflecting back on the conversations of Pac, that we don't have no control over when we're going to die. And I never thought about that way and that type of way prior to that. You know what I mean? I used to believe I didn't really have too much concern over death, you know? But when you lose someone that's close to you, you start to think, you start to reflect, you know? And you were not a Muslim. And now you're thinking about death, it hits you, and how do, how do you get in contact with Islam and Muslims? No, um, I got in contact, you know, with the Muslims. One day I happened to be fighting my own little brother, and alhamdulillah, there was a Muslim brother who stopped the fight. We exchanged phone numbers, and he invited me to the masjid. So one day I decided to take his invitation. I went to the mosque, me and my friends. And to be honest, growing up, I didn't, res I didn't trust Muslims. I didn't even... Well, the people that murdered my mother and father was from a group of people called the Nation of Islam. I'm not sure if the people heard of the Nation of Islam, huh? You heard of them? So the people that murdered my father was from the Nation of Islam. So my grandmother used to tell me the people that killed your parents were Muslim. So I grew up believing that Muslims killed my parents. And this... When you say your parents were Muslims, were they Muslims from the Nation of Islam? Or they were Orthodox? Well, the Nation of Islam, they're not Muslims. Yeah, you know? no, no. The Nation of Islam are not Muslims. Parents, they my parents, they left the nation. Okay. When Malcolm X, yeah. when he went to Mecca, he left the Nation of Islam. My parents, alhamdulillah, they left them. They accepted the religion of Islam. Okay. 
And um, but I didn't know that growing up. I didn't know the difference between the Nation of Islam and Muslims, you know. So, but this individual, he stopped a fight with my brother, and he was very kind. His o'clock, his manners was very good, and he invited me to visit the masjid, you know, the mosque. So eventually, I went up there. I had a loaded gun with me. Like I said, I didn't trust Muslims, you know. And I had maybe about. You had a gun with you. Of course, man. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on, you know. I really was jahil. I was that ignorant. You know, I was that ignorant. So when I went up there with my friends, and it was in a neighborhood, South Central Los Angeles, which is a gang-infested community neighborhood. So when we went up there, you know, the first thing that hit me, I was noticing that some of the Muslims, they was getting off the bus. Some of them didn't have money. Some of their clothes wasn't up to par. But every single one of them was happy. Here I am on my side with an $80,000 Lexus, probably jewelry on cars, but I'm very depressed. I'm not happy. So I wanted to know what does these people have that I don't have, you know? So I'm, but I'm looking at them from a materialistic standpoint, you know? And I'm looking at them and I'm judging them and I'm wondering why everybody have a smile on their face. And I wanted that, you know what I mean? I wanted that inner peace. So I sat there in the mansion and I, I figured I would spend some time and they would reveal whatever it is, you know? And eventually the brother, mashallah, he gave me Quran, the English translation of the Quran. And when I took it home, I started to read the Quran. And from the first time that I read the Quran, I knew that these cannot be the words of a man. You know, coming from the music industry, we pay attention to the lyrics of other artists and other rappers. But reading the Quran, I say, there's no way a man can think like this. And that's the first thing that hit me is that I needed that religion in my life, you know. So uh, from that incident, when you and your brother were fighting and you went to the masjid and called the Quran, when yeah. did you, like, revert or convert to Islam? Actually, when I got the Quran, I went home. I went straight home and I read the Quran. I believe it, it might have been the next day that I called the brother and I told him I wanted to be a Muslim. You know, it, it was it, it clarified everything. It clarified to me what the religion of Islam was based upon. From reading it, I knew that the religion of Islam and the nation of Islam was two different religions, and it was clear to me that Islam was from the one who created me, from the words, um, the structure, the style of the Quran, even though it was in the English language. I knew that a man cannot come up with these words, you know? So, can you tell us the day that you converted to Islam? I don't remember the exact day, you know what I mean? But it was 11 years ago, alhamdulillah. I've been Muslim for 11 years, alhamdulillah. So, um, you become a Muslim. You're still part of the music industry. Yes. So, what is it that breaks you off from the music industry? Do you break, do you cut the ties immediately or is it like a... Gradual step. Now, it took some time, you know what I mean? When I first accepted the religion of Islam, I was still doing music. I still was um, involved in the music industry. The first year of me accepting Islam, I was able to go to Hajj a few months later. So when I came back from Hajj, I didn't want to do so-called gangster music anymore. So I did music with no cuss words. You know, I thought I was making halal music, you know? And um, so I stayed in the music industry for some time until I started to investigate more and more about music. You know, I remember, matter of fact, I went to Hajj. And um, I met, in Hajj, I met these Pakistanis from Canada. And when they asked me what I do, I told them I'm in the music industry. And they started saying, music's haram. And I thought they was terrorists. I'm like, man, who in the world say music's haram? They have big beards, you know what I mean? I said, these people gotta be terrorists. So every time I see them in a the hotel, I run away from them, you know what I mean? But then I kept hearing people say music this and music is not, music is permissible, music is not. So I decided as an individual, I wanted to read and know about my, um, myself. Yeah. So when I read about it, and to me, it was clear to me that the music industry and the music has no place in Islam. It was clear to me. So after that, I was able to walk away from it. How did you walk away? Did you just say, okay, I'm out of here? And you just packed up your stuff? Nah, man, it wasn't that easy, you know, because I actually was in a contract. I was in a contract with an individual by the name of Johnny J. He used to be a producer of Tupac. And he, we did a whole album together. You know, he spent maybe about $150,000. So in order for me to walk away, I had to give him that money back, which I didn't have. So, you know, after speaking to some people, they, they find I was in a contract. They say, fulfill your contract. Then after that, halas, you can go, you know? So, but this individual, after completing the album and the contract, he's supposed to put it out a year later, you know? He didn't put it out. So I kept trying to be patient with him because he was a friend of mine. I know him since I was 13, 14 years old. I came at him one day and I said, to be honest, I don't want to be involved in the music industry anymore. Um, but you spent a lot of money. This is your rights. And I want you to make your money back or I want to fulfill my rights. 
So please release the album, you know? He never released the album, it could take us some time. And after making Dua, you know, I remember every day I used to ask Allah, please get me out of the industry, please get me out of the industry, because it started to get clear to me what the music industry was about. You know, even though at that particular time I was doing music with no cuss words, so-called positive music, but I still had to go to nightclubs to rap, you know what I mean? I still had to be around the same diseases. It doesn't matter what form or what you're saying, you're gonna be around that disease and that corruption of the music industry. So after a while, one day he, I get a call from my lawyer and they said, um, Johnny J, he just sent the letter, he just he released you from the contract, alhamdulillah. And he don't want a penny back, so alhamdulillah. Uh, how, how did your uh, grandparents react when you, when you told them that you became a Muslim? Because they've been telling you that your parents were murdered by Muslims. So, and, and also your friends, how did they react and you know, other people around you? Uh, well, my grandparents from my father's side, they was dead already, you know, they passed away. Um, prior, before I accepted the religion of Islam. My mother, my mother parents, um, especially her mother is very, she's a, a, a Hispanic, you know, she's Puerto Rican, Spanish, so they're very hard Catholics, you know, so she didn't want to hear it at all. You know, I tried to give a dawah, and kept trying to give a dawah, but she didn't want to hear it at all. But the rest of my, she was supportive, you know what I mean? She was supportive, she didn't care um, if I accepted the religion of Islam or not. My family was very supportive, both sides of my family very supportive, my brothers, they all accepted Islam, alhamdulillah. The outlaws, they all accepted Islam. So my close friends, they all became Muslim, alhamdulillah. Were you married at that time? Was I married? Yeah. No way. Oh. You know, before Islam, I didn't even know if I ever mentioned marriage in Were my you conversation. Married today? Alhamdulillah, I'm married, alhamdulillah. You know. Uh, okay. Um, so now with, with with Islam, where yeah. are you? Like in, in your because uh, one brother, when I posted this on Facebook, I said I'm going to interview Napoleon. And one brother told me he, he had an interesting question, no. and that was uh, to put the question to you: is, uh, is what do you have with you today that you learn from your past, from the music industry? Is there anything from the music industry that no. you can say that you have with you today that is something positive, or is everything like totally negative? No, with the music industry, um, you might have some positive stuff. But the evil outweighs the good, you know, similar to khamr, to alcohol. As Allah says in the Quran that even in khamr and alcohol, there's some benefit. But he said refrain from it because the evil outweighs the good. So the music industry is like that. You know, you can learn, um, you can learn the business ideas from the music industry. Um, especially me, when I was 14, 15 years old, I had to stand out on my own. You know, I'm away from my family, so it made me a young man quickly. Um, it made me, um, it put me on my toes, alhamdulillah, you know. So that's probably about it that I said that I would take from the music industry as that past life is some, some instincts that you get, you know, from the streets, from the hood, that Islam tells you you don't have to run away from that, you know. So. You know, something that's really big today on the yeah. internet is like spoken word. There's yeah. so many Muslim artists like uh, Bona and other people doing uh, spoken word, which is like almost like rap, but there's no instruments in the background. Uh, is that something that you would maybe kind of consider? Well, for me, as you know, in Islam, um, even amongst the Sahaba, they used to do poetry, you know, spoken word, whatever, what we would call it poetry, of course, without music. But the difference between the Sahaba and what we're seeing in our time, the Sahaba, they didn't make entertainment from it. You know what I mean? They didn't go around on tours, they didn't perform, so for me, if I ever do it, maybe I would just write, you know what I mean, maybe, but I, I won't feel comfortable traveling around the world and performing it because this wasn't something the people who was way better than us that Allah praising the Quran done, you know, so I don't want to do something that maybe is not good, so I stay away from it, you know. So what's your aspirations today? What is your goals? No. My goal now is to learn more about my religion. I'm studying the Arabic language. I live in Saudi Arabia now for the last two and a half years. So I'm trying to study, learn the Arabic language, trying to better myself as a Muslim, and um, you know, try to learn my deen, you know, inshallah. What is your experience of Saudi Arabia, like a Muslim country, compared to the United States of America? Yeah. Well, alhamdulillah, I've been going to Saudi for, since I accepted Islam. You know, I used to go to Umrah maybe every year, alhamdulillah. So before I moved there, I kind of understood the culture of the people. And Saudi Arabia, wallahi, is a very blessed place, you know what I mean? It's, you don't realize it until you live there. The people love Islam. You have the support of Islam all around you. Um, the masajid is on every corner. 
I live in the neighborhood. I have some very good neighbors, alhamdulillah. So it reminded me of almost like my childhood that I was missing. You know, in the music industry, um, when I lived in certain neighborhoods, you don't even, the neighbors don't even speak to you. So you know now living in Saudi Arabia, you might get the doorbell ringing and all of a sudden your neighbor's sending you gawa out of beer, sending you some food, and sending you some cups. Or sending. So that's the, what I miss, you know what I mean? That, that family and that brotherhood that we have in Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah. So are you like permanently gonna stay in Saudi Arabia now or you like, you wanna build up your knowledge in Saudi Arabia? I wanna raise my kids in Saudi, you know what I mean? I wanna live there um, for myself and my kids and for my family until I die. You know, I want to go back to America, I can visit my family, but to have an opportunity to raise your kids in a society that's, you know, you don't have to worry about what we worry about in America, in the West, I, I thank Allah, you know, for this. So, of course, I will go back, visit America, visit my friends, but this is a blessing from Allah, and I want to be able to live in the Muslim countries and raise my kids, inshallah. You're ambitious, alhamdulillah. And there's a documentary that came out, and now the app just came out as well. Yeah. <laughs> that one. Could, you, could you just tell us about the documentary that you did? Yes. Is it no, no. app? Yeah, we have a documentary called Life of an Outlaw. And this documentary is about my life. I actually come, I have a friend of mine who's from um, Toronto, Canada, for maybe four or five years. He kept asking me, please do, let me do a documentary on your life. And at the beginning, I wasn't comfortable, you know? And I would tell him, holler at me next year. You know, holler at me in six months. I kept trying to put him off, you know. And one day, you know, I went to one of the scholars in Medina. And I got advice, you know, from Sheikh Abdul Musan al-Abad. He's a, one of the big scholars in Medina. And because some people, I was asking some friends of mine, what do you think if I do this documentary? Some people say no. Some people say do it. Some people say you're exposing your sins. So I went to one of the scholars and I asked him, what should I, is it permissible in Islam for me to do this documentary? So he gave me some good advice. He said, yeah, it's permissible as long as you don't you know, transgress the limits set by Islam. You know what I mean? And, and if you speak about your past, as long as you don't do it to where you glamorizing that lifestyle, but you do it to educate the people. And he said the same way the Salaf, the earlier Muslims used to do. You have stories of the Sahaba. How did we know that Umar bin Qatab buried his daughters a lot, his daughter a lot before Islam? How did we know about Fidel Ibn Iyad going to commit zina, fornication with a woman before Islam? He said, so these stories, the earlier Muslims wasn't doing it to expose their sins, but they was doing it to educate the people. So I was able to do my documentary with one of the brothers, mashallah, and it's about my life prior to the religion of Islam, growing up in my neighborhood, how I met Tupac, my involvement in the music industry, how I felt the day that Tupac died. We actually have footage that nobody seen of Tupac that we was able to get from his mother and from his estate. And at the end, it talks about my life and why I accept the religion of Islam. So, that documentary we have on our website, as I mentioned, lifeofanoutlaw.com. Um, I, I always put live updates on my Twitter account, Mouton Napoleon, on my Facebook account, um, the Mouton Napoleon Bill, and the app. Like you mentioned, we have an um, iPad app, you know, for free. If you don't want to, yeah, if you don't want to, you don't, but you got to pay for the movie, man. I got to make some money. <laughs> okay, so you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You see the movie? Okay. Of course, I got to make a lot of money, man. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Okay. So, you know what I mean? If they want to watch the movie, they pay. You yeah. know, it's not much. Well, but, extra material on the app? Yeah, yeah the, app. the app. We have like uh, video footage and stuff like that that you can download for free, alhamdulillah. Yeah. It's LOA, Life of an Outlaw. Yeah. So I went into your Instagram and your Facebook and I was looking around and I saw that you were in Ireland. So I mean, you've been to Sweden, you tell, you told your story, you've been around. Yeah. Yeah. How many countries have you been around and told your story? Man. Alhamdulillah, man, you know, all this is from Allah, it's a blessing from Allah. You know, none of this we can achieve without Allah. So I'm thankful that I'm able to, that, you know, travel and be able to speak to the youth. Um, Alhamdulillah, I went to a few countries, mashallah. I'm, I'm especially around the Middle East, I'm always around the Middle East. Um, the, I spent a great amount of time in the UAE, that's like my second home, alhamdulillah. I went to my How are the Arab kids in UAE and Saudi the kids, Arabia? The kids. Are they like looking up to Tupac and they're like, because I think I saw the trailer to your yeah. documentary and you were like, you were in UAE or Dubai and they had like, I mean, graffiti on the walls. They'd be like Tupac or, you know, hip hop stuff. And you were like, subhanAllah, what's this? They don't know what they're looking up to. You had that, that even in Saudi, you know what I mean? But in the UAE, you have this, but the good part about these countries the majority of the people were upon care, they were upon good, you know what I mean? Um, in Saudi, for example, I was just telling the brothers, I was very, I was amazed one day I was in Saudi and um, somebody bumping gangster music, you know what I mean? And my kids get confused, they like, daddy, you say that, 
you know, Muslims don't do this, and what is, what is he doing? You know, I said, but he's still a Muslim, first of all. We don't make takfir and say he listens to music, you're not a Muslim. That's not what I'm trying to say. We don't do that, because he's still a Muslim, alhamdulillah. But um, the thing about Saudi, if they see you with a beard, and if they listen to music, or, and you look at them, wallahi, they turn it down automatically. So, and even recently, one day I was um, walking into a gas station, and it was a car with tinted windows, and this kid in Saudi, he was bumping Eminem. Mother F this, F that, F that. So I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, you know what I mean? So I just started walking over to the car, you know? And the, the, the brother, he rode down the window. Very, they very respectful. One thing I can say, they, they respectful. It's not like America, if you go to buy somebody, you might get shot, you know? <laughs> but they was very respectful. When he turned down the car, I told him, Anna Amriki, Gabo Islam, like, Anna, I used to do Mughani, I used to do music, but alhamdulillah, Allah guided me to Islam. I'm here in your country. And you know, you should be careful from listening to these things, it's poison. I tried to advise them and they was, alhamdulillah, not to try to expose that I did some good deeds, but I'm saying it's to show the khair that the people, they have, mashallah, they still have it, alhamdulillah. So you, you've been talking around, telling your story. How have the reaction been from, from young Muslims and non-Muslims as well? Is there a difference or yeah. is everybody like appreciative or are there people who are like, uh, we don't really like that. Uh, that you're saying that music is totally haram because we have like artists like Maher Zayn who is like he has like no. one million fans on Facebook. He's so huge and big, and he's no. doing this. You know, they call no. it Islamic news. I don't know what they call, it, no. but you know, yeah. still so, have so. all these. No. How the reaction? Honestly, man, usually when I go out to do talks, I don't really like to start off with haram. This is haram and that's haram. You know, maybe because even here we might have some non-Muslims in the audience. And they might think about Islam and they might say, well, I love music and now you're saying this is haram. But the message is not that because the Prophet Sallallahu he called the first 13 years of Islam was the call into Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. You know, Allah says in the Quran that after you accept the religion of Islam, he will forgive every sin. You know what I mean? So you have people that they might accept Islam and they have alcoholic problems or they drinking or they smoking. We pray that Allah, of course, they get away from this, but these are not sins that Allah will not forgive. So if there's anybody in the audience that love music or whatever, we don't want to scare them away, you know what I mean? But the truth is the truth, you understand? Um, if the people realize the effect that music have on the people, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, you know what I mean? Um, it, like Ibn Qayyim al Josiah, rahimahullah, he said that you, you would not find the same heart that have the love of music in the Quran in the same heart. One of them will repel the other, you know what I mean? And um, even they did a study in Toronto University about musical instruments alone. And you would be surprised what they came up with. So in Islam, and, and, and also it's not about what I say. It's not about the opinion of Mutah, it's not about the opinion of Mahazain, you said. It's not about the opinion of these individuals. Allah says in the Quran, whenever you differ amongst yourself, refer back to Allah and His Messenger. If you truly believe in Allah in the last day. And you have verses in the Quran about music, hadith, all four school of thoughts. They all say music haram, all the sahabas. So this is not my ding, you know, we, that I made up. This is from Allah and His Messenger. We follow it, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, brother Bill. Um, obviously, many of the youths in the West are trying to pursue the, the, the fame you lived. And you've seen what it, what it is and what it ain't, right? Uh, what, advice, what advice would you give to these youths, especially in Western societies, on how to distance themselves from the false materialism and revert back to the deen? Uh, I would say, um, you know, that lifestyle that many people don't know is very, especially from the outside looking in, of course they're gonna beautify that lifestyle. But once you get involved in that lifestyle, man, even if we use our common sense, and if we, not even from a religion standpoint of view, let's put Islam to the side, just look at the condition of those involved in that industry. Look at the condition of the entertainers, of the rappers, of the actors. Can you show me one of them that have a decent life? You know what I mean? And um, that's not high on drugs, that's not doped up, that's not coked up, you know what I mean? That's not having a terrible life. That industry crumbled the society, it crumbles families, it destroys lives. So it's very important, man, that I would tell the kids, man, it's, it's better to educate yourself. Get a degree, go to education, finish your school, start your own business, get a decent job or career. You have a better chance working at McDonald's than getting in the music industry nowadays, you know what I mean? So it's better to stay away from that, for sure. Thank you, there's one question 
There's a lot of questions coming through the message. Uh, and this is uh, one question I would like to put forward. It's like, uh, sounds like this. Is Tupac still alive? Wow. Do you have, do they, have you ever heard that question before? Of course, of course man. man. What's up with that? You know, you know, we get, because you saw him. him. You saw him. No, I'm sorry. Pac is unfortunately he's dead. You know what I mean? And um, um, he passed away. He's he's he didn't fake his death. He's not somewhere hiding in Jamaica like the people say. Unfortunately, he he passed away. You know. Another question: Is it true that you gave all your money to poor people? I wish I was that good, you know, but that's not true. You know, I'm. Um, I wish I was that type of person, but I didn't. Another interesting question is, uh, do you regret your past? I don't regret my past, man. I, you know, I look at my past as an um, educational experience, you know what I mean? If it wasn't for my past, I wouldn't be in the situation that I'm in now. You know, I might not agree with, you know, my past and the things that I've done in my past, but I definitely don't regret it, you know?